Hello. Great to see you. I'm going to make sure everything's connected up right. Here from my sources on the inside, whether uh, we've got things going on on YouTube and on Facebook and all of that. Um, and so far it looks like things are good. So I'm happy about that. I'm so happy to see you here. This is day one of the Four Seasons What Lies Beneath. And what we're going to do this week is really reverse engineer a <laughs> successful performance or learn how to reverse engineer a not very successful performance if that's what we want. And I'm going to mute this. Um, and if the top of my head is cut off on YouTube, then I, I want to lower myself a, a little bit. Um, it's probably a good policy anyway. Because the title of this, What Lies Beneath, right, is... <laughs> okay. YouTube, it seems... Well, all right. I can't lower myself anymore, so... Um... What lies beneath, I keep using this iceberg metaphor, right? And so the tip of the iceberg, right, is the performance, the thing that everyone sees, and everything else we hide from our audience, from our listeners. And sometimes we, we even hide it from ourselves. We pretend like the rest of that doesn't really matter, or there's nothing much we can do about it anyway. That's all about performance day. So. I'm going to open up um, really everything to you this week, share with you the practicing, of course, that went into my recent performance of the Four Seasons at the Hollywood Bowl. But then I'm going to share with you, of course, some actual footage from the concert. And then we're going to talk about how to connect the dots. What was it about everything that's happened. I'm not going to take you back to the very beginning of my life, but the combined experience that I've had with the violin, without the violin, with the score, what is it about all of that that led to what happened on stage? Because not everything that happened on stage was exactly the way I wanted, and you're going to see and hear that. I'm going to share with you what was going through my head while I was playing. Was I happy? nervous, stressed? Was it just a complete blank out-of-body experience? <laughs> and then to be able to reflect after, which is what this week is all about, so that the next time I play this piece or the next time I perform any piece, I can have a better sense of what kind of preparation I need to do. That's exactly what I want for you. The next time you step out to perform, whether that's just for friends and family in your own house, in a library, a school, out on stage, an audition, because an audition is nothing more than a carefully curated performance of small selections. The next time you go out to do that, I want you to feel confident that your preparation can lead to the kind of performance you want. So for anyone here who does not already have my free downloads, <laughs> the materials, um, I want to invite you to grab that right now. There are links in the description on YouTube and on Facebook. If you follow those links, you'll be able to, to register, even though we've already started, you'll be able to register. What I've got for you is a, a short workbook that I'm going to refer to this week during What Lies Beneath. It's a way to organize our thoughts and to really make the most of what we're doing this week to really make your next performance your best one, your most confident, your most fun. Um, it's something you can take away with you and refer back to. And it contains the music for the slow movement of Vivaldi's Winter, which we're going to learn and refine together over these five days. The other thing you get to download is my complete set of marked parts for the Four Seasons. I've left the slow movement of Winter blank, as I said. Um, so that we can do that together 
but the rest of it I've got my bowings and fingerings in there, some shaping ideas. So I, I hope you enjoy having that. That's also something you can take away with you. So I'm going to keep an eye on uh, the comments. Of course, I can't watch the entire chat, but I've got friends with me who are passing along some of your questions and comments. So if you're here with me live, you got a good chance of me answering your question and uh, tell your friends, tell your friends to join live. Great. If you will look in that workbook that you've hopefully downloaded, um, right after the, the cover picture, we've got a page that's called practice makes performance. You know, we've all heard that expression practice, um, practice makes perfect. And then some of the, the smarter people say mm, practice doesn't make perfect. Uh, perfect practice makes perfect, which I suppose is also true. Um, but since there is no such thing as perfect practice, I prefer to say practice makes performance, right? The way you practice leads directly to your performance. It's what we're exploring this week. And for me, there are three parts to that. And, and I love the way this is represented on this page, you know, got these three circles. You can also think of them as three pillars. Pillars need to hold something up, don't they? <laughs> what they hold up is great music. I only want to play great music. Sometimes I, I have to play some music that I think is less than the very best. Vivaldi's Four Seasons, though, is great. <laughs> now, I was only reminded of that getting to work on it and perform it again this past uh, couple weeks. So these three pillars, what they hold up is great music, the kind that speaks to you, the kind that moves your listeners, and that deepens your relationship with the violin. Mindset, tools, and techniques. So I've got to say a, a few words about these because they're really going to inform everything that we're doing this week. Mindset is <clears throat> more than just having, you know, a positive attitude. I like a positive attitude. I want to go into every performance with a positive attitude. That's just a smart thing to do. But as we all know, it's not enough just to, to think positive, right? Just because I think I can do something doesn't mean it's going to happen on stage. If I think I can't do something, that's a pretty sure indicator that it's not going to happen on stage. But just thinking I can, not quite enough. So mindset really encompasses every note I play, every bow I draw. And as an example in the practice room, mindset tells me I'm not going to adjust fingers once I put them down in the practice room. So when I'm in practice mode, if I play, you know, it's tempting to adjust that right up because it was out of tune. But that habit, if left unchecked, <laughs> can start going everywhere. <laughs> that sounds like an exaggeration, but I've heard people play where suddenly their fingers forget how to go down with authority because they're so used to adjusting in the practice room. And you could call that faulty technique, but really I just call it mindset. If you make a rule, that you're going to lift and replace and go back and repeat. And that every time you put that finger down, it goes down where it goes down. And I'm going to listen to where it is. That's a mindset thing. If you make a rule as I do, that you're not going to have any preliminary bows, preliminary noises. That's all this kind of How many times do we start? Or the, uh, taking five, six, seven extra bows, finding notes and kind of getting a running start into passages. 
that stuff kills performance because you don't get to do that in the performance. That again is a mindset thing. So if you decide that stuff's not for me, I'm going to start building these habits day by day. That's all mindset. And yes, <clears throat> believing that you can solve a problem and then actively searching for the solutions and working on them, then you've earned your positive mindset, your musical mindset, successful mindset. I, I love that word success because success doesn't mean perfect. Success means you had a plan, you went with it, and then you get to refine it for next time. Tools, um, tools and techniques, those are both imperfect words, I suppose, but tools, I'm talking about basic skills and the, the sort of studies or etudes that support those skills. So tools are things like double stops, uh, bow strokes, um, etudes like Kreutzer II that we can use to work on different bow strokes, right? Or Spiccato is a tool, but, but so is Kreutzer II, which I might use to, to work on Spiccato. So the tools we have, it's our skill set, it's the library of support material that we've built up to, su yeah, to support those, <laughs> those major building blocks. And then techniques, that's what we don't often get to talk about in lessons very much how to practice, practice techniques. How many times do you repeat something? Like that thing I was doing earlier. Okay, that was in tune, but earlier, let's see, two or three times earlier today, I played it flat. So am I good playing it once in tune? Probably not. Three times, 300. How many times do I need to repeat this before I can feel pretty confident that it's going to be better the next time. That all goes under practice techniques. And do I just repeat it at full tempo? Do I isolate? Do I change fingerings? Do I play in a different octave? Do I change the rhythms? Do I practice without vibrato? These are all practice techniques. So the tools would be vibrato. Tools would be my finger angle on the string, right? Working on setup. Techniques, what do I do with those skills? How do I put them together in the practice room to lead to the musical performance? So those three together form the practice makes performance system. And that's the system, by the way, that I've been using in my high level virtuoso master course for the last five years, really. So the people that I've worked with most closely week in, week out, um, this is the whole system. We talk about this all the time. And so um, if I'm gonna share with you how I prepared this Vivaldi performance, gotta talk about practice makes performance. Flip ahead in your workbook. We're not going to talk about every question and every page, but I just want to help set our goals for the week and plant the seed, really, <clears throat> so that you can be thinking about these questions even as I'm sharing with you parts of my performance and my process. This week is about you. We've got one page for mindset, one page for tools, one page for practice techniques, and... <clears throat> Each page basically takes us past, present, and future. Okay, so on the mindset page, we're going to be talking about your last live performance. Or if, if you don't want to talk about your last one, imagine one that was important to you and recent enough that you can remember some things about it. So that could have been an audition. 
Um, <clears throat> maybe it was a lesson that you took. Maybe you traveled somewhere to take a lesson with someone post COVID. And, and that is the performance you're thinking of. Whatever it is, by the end of the week, I want you to have put some thoughts down in each of these boxes. Because I want you to think what your feeling was going into the performance. Just general kind of mindset. Terrified. Really looking forward to it. Sort of even keel. There are going to be some ups. There are going to be some downs. Feeling great about two movements and lousy about a third one. Um, looking forward to playing for a certain person you knew was going to be in the audience or really wishing that certain person wasn't going to be in the audience, but they're going to be anyway. So any of your thoughts. <clears throat> and then during the performance, this can be hard to remember sometimes. I've come off stage where I just feel like that was like some, right, some <laughs> traumatic event and I can't remember a thing. It's like it all passed by in the blink of an eye and I don't know what just happened. So if that's the case, you can put that down. But if you can remember anything you were feeling, thinking during the performance, that those internal battles, voices in your head or on your shoulders, I'm going to be sharing some of those with you this week for sure. And then how you felt afterward. And if you can't remember how you felt just after, write down what your impressions are now. So this is your mindset before, during, and after. On the tools page again, this is not all for today. I'll be giving you some time during our sessions to, to mark some thoughts down or you can do it in between. For tools, remember these are kind of the building block skills or studies. For that last performance, are there skills you had to learn just in order to play the piece and put down some details about that? Were there ones that you already knew you had locked in going in? And then how did those two come out? The new skills plus the well-established skills, how they came out in performance. And finally, the practice techniques. You know, what was your process like? Was it different from other performances or, or more the same? I'm interested in how much of the time you thought ahead to the final performance in the practice room, in your preparation. And then finally, I'm interested to know how much of your time you got to devote to artistic interpretive questions versus note learning, sharpening your tools, that sort of thing. So let's get to the four seasons. Let's get to a couple weeks ago. So on August 31st is when I played all four seasons uh, together with conductor Gemma New at the Hollywood Bowl. And I was really happy to have my colleagues in the LA Phil on stage with me. Um, it's just nice to play with friends, you know. I don't do a lot of, you know, the, the soloist's life where they're playing with a different orchestra every week. And I know if you've been doing that for a long time, you get to know people in different orchestras, but still you're always a guest and it's a different feeling from playing on the stage that you're used to with the people you're used to playing with. So <clears throat> I can tell you I had a nice advantage going in because I knew I had everybody's support. You know, everybody wanted me to play well. And it's worth saying that I've come to imagine this even if I don't know it's true. Because it's a helpful thing to think that everybody wants you to play well, everybody's there to hear you play well, and to enjoy the music that you're going to make. So I encourage you to start making that part of your mindset all the time. Yes, <clears throat> even in auditions, an orchestra audition where you're, it might seem like everybody's just interested in cutting as many people as possible, as fast as possible. But I assure you, sitting on the committee, the opposite is the case. I want you to play really well. I want to hear great playing. So the sooner you can make that part of your core mindset, the better. I chose to play the piece from memory. Um, I'm going to admit it's partly vanity. 
<laughs> because I love the the look and the feeling of not having anything between me and the audience. Um, partly a test for myself, you know, can I do it? A little bit of fear mixed in there. I'm worried that if I stop performing from memory, that I'll never be able to start back up again, that I'll kind of lose the nerve to do it. And there is some musical justification too. Um, when I challenge myself to play from memory, I'm forced to examine the pieces in different ways. I'm forced to think more harmonically so that I have more ways to recover should something go wrong. Um, it's easier for me to remember a piece if I'm thinking of the structure as well as the little contours, the melodic contours and the melodic line. And I just, the more I know a piece, the more I know the whole score, the easier it is for me to memorize anyway. So that was a choice I made for this one. I'm not saying it'll be the choice for everything. And I will tell you that my feeling going in was, it was a little bit of a mixture. I was the most confident in the pieces that I had played the most before. So later on, I'll share some stories about the different seasons, but suffice it to say, I'd played spring a lot ever since I was a teenager and I'd played it memorized a lot. Um, winter I had played, uh, performed a little bit, also memorized, but it had been a long time. But summer and autumn, I had never performed as a soloist. Um, now I have accompanied this piece a million times. Um, I've always loved it. And that experience is valuable to get to be there on stage while other soloists would play the material and compare, you know, when I was younger, it would just be like, oh, they sound good. They don't sound good. Now this is in tune, this is out of tune. I like that. I don't like that. As I got older, I would really get into everybody's different interpretation and think, I wonder by the way they're playing now with how they're leading me, can I tell what they're going to do next? Yeah, they're leading me toward this and boom, there it is. Really satisfying. They led me there based on what they were doing. And I love that. Or, hmm, this didn't make sense to me. I got this choice, but I didn't get that choice. So I'm going to start sharing a little video with you. And I'm going to attempt to tell you what measures these things come from. Um, look with me, if you would, at the beginning of spring. If you can pull up my marked part, then we'll have the same, the same uh, music and I can refer to measure numbers with you. So, whole thing starts with an opening tutti section and, you know, everything in here is alternating you know, the soloist plays virtually the entire time, but sometimes doubling with the first violins and other times, of course, breaking free. The opening to this is one of the most famous bits in all of classical music, right? Etc. Um, first chance I get to break away is in the middle of bar 14, um, midway through the bar. And here, imitating birdsong, right? And anybody who plays this piece gets to decide how closely do I want to stick to the page? I don't know how many of you know that Vivaldi wrote the sonnets in Italian, the sonnets that give the, the story, the program to this music. And not only did he write them, you know, alongside or, you know, as a companion to the music, but he actually wrote the lines in the music at the places uh, which they were describing. So here at A, Birdsong, um, he, he's not leaving this up to chance. He's telling you this is Birdsong. So am I going to stick pretty much to what's on the page or am I going to sort of take license and, and even try to imitate birds? You know,
I will say that I generally hewed more to toward the traditional and uh, I you know I kept the rhythms that were there I didn't mess around with the trills too much I did enjoy really playing these notes and getting out of the way when it was more accompanimental because the first chair first violinist and the second chair first violinist they all and the principal second they all get to chime in as well so it's it's a whole uh meeting of the minds with the birds so let's take a look at a clip and i'm going to hope that all this works the way it should and this is going to come in right there it's my first solo entrance First of all, those uh, <laughs> that white dinner jacket. That's uh, every time I come home from a Hollywood Bowl concert, I always feel like someone's going to throw me their car keys and tell me to park their car. Um, yeah, it, it, it's fun actually. It, I took the liberty. So, if I'm not the soloist, I have to wear a, a jacket that's pure white. It has to be white. And uh, if you've ever shopped for a pure white jacket you'll know that they pretty much only make them out of polyester and they're hot and uncomfortable so since i was the soloist i had the chance to wear a nice wool um which is actually cooler and it was ivory colored so that was my big my big score there um so as i said i was confident in spring more than all the other seasons and that's a good thing since spring is first um, it's always great to to have more confidence in what you've in what you're starting with um, whenever you have an introduction like an opening 2d and then a solo section <clears throat> i always feel like i've got a clock that starts now i don't know how how many of you relate to this or, or what your own clock is i tend to be i tend to start getting more nervous after i start playing now i'm nervous before you know, half an hour before, 15 minutes before, you know, the day before, all that, that's, there's a buzz, right? When I walk out and I get the applause, I'm generally feeling like, oh, this, this is great. This is why I'm here. I'm looking forward to this. Um, as soon as I play my first solo notes and everything else drops out and I hear my own sound on that stage on that day or night, um, then I start the adrenaline starts for me right about then. And after about 60 or 90 seconds, I'm really jazzed up. And if things are going to get a little bit shaky, um, physically shaky, I mean, or sort of tense, that's usually when it's going to happen. Um, and then the adrenaline courses through and it gets to a, a more baseline level that reflects my preparation. Um, so what does this all mean? It means that I really need to look at those things that happen one to two minutes into a piece because I, I can be sure that I'm going to have a little bit more juice going through me than normal. So <clears throat> in this clip, and we're going to listen to it again, um, there was a funny thing. I had never decided, I realized on stage, I had never decided when I was going to quit playing with the orchestra and find my first solo note. <laughs> um, because if you look at it on the page, it just goes right up. <clears throat> but I got smart a few days before and I realized, you know, I should be cutting out a little early to really 
make sure I have that note and get the, just the articulation I want for that. Um, but I didn't really rehearse my routine for that. I rehearsed it a few times, but not quite enough. And in the moment, I didn't give myself quite enough time to find that note, and I ended up a little bit sharp. Now, we violinists have an expression, right? Better sharp than out of tune. Um, but nevertheless, there's where it needed to be. And I was just a shade higher than that. So I'll chalk it up to bird song. Um, but what needed to happen was that I needed to have a place where I was going to cut out maybe a whole bar before. That would have been great. Um, I find too that um, you'll see microphones in there. Um, and what this video is, it's a video of the Jumbotron. Most of these videos are gonna be videos of the big screens that we have alongside the Hollywood Bowl. I'm gonna show you at least one video from way back where you can get more sense of the scene. But you'll see in these videos that uh, there are two microphones. They were quite close to me. I would say they were, you know, I, if I had reached out my bow like this, I would have touched the microphone. So they were about three feet away at the most. Um, so there was no need for me to press. We're going to talk about that more later. <clears throat> no need for me to press um, or to exaggerate articulation, but I still found that this could have been more demonstrative. Um, I think I was, especially at the beginning, I was a little bit worried about the mics picking up too much noise, but I should have left that to the pros running the audio, and I would have liked to... to have been a little bit more demonstrative with the articulation. So <clears throat> let me just run this one back. We don't have to watch the whole thing, but I want to own up to the fact that I was a little sharp and I hear that articulation again. So here we go. Yeah, <clears throat> and seeing it again, one other thing I hadn't quite decided for sure, and I, I know about myself that I've, I've left this to chance in other performances too. Do I want to find the string in between each of those so that each one is from the string? Or is it a rebound? I opted for the rebound or it seems like that's just what happened in this performance. Um, thus, the kind of softer articulation, but still, I'll take it. I was happy to get off the ground in this one. Um, first solo entrance, sing it out, and still feeling pretty good. Um, the next clip we're going to look at is, you know, a rather famous place in the first movement. Um, and that is, if you look on page... It's marked as page three in the PDF. Uh, this famous place, the... I do change that to a D natural. Um, half people do it one way, half do it the other. Um, this is sort of the, you know, if you ever watch figure skating in the Olympics or something, um, some of you may know this already, but generally the toughest trick you know, the hardest sequence goes almost right at the beginning when the legs are fresh. So nobody does a routine and saves the triple axle for last or, you know, the, the combination for last. It's generally, it's like a roller coaster where the biggest hill has to be first because you, unless they're hydraulic trickery, you can't have a bigger hill than the first one. Um, so spring is a little bit like that where right away we've got this place that everybody judges you by, right? <laughs> Now, as I was saying, this also happens to be right about the spot 
where my adrenaline <laughs> is kicking in. Now, in some ways, that that's nice for the bow arm because I'm not. If I were trying to hold a long, quiet note, then that's bad news. Instead, what I'm doing is playing fast and loud, so that's all right. But um, in the left hand, what I knew I would need was something very relaxed so that I could just get the spacing right, right? The fingers aren't having to move so much faster than all of that. Um, there's a lot of bow work. Um, speaking of tools, um, fast string changes is something I've worked on for a long time. Um, and when I'm playing let me just say that my arm really only needs to be in one spot and that's the double stop level between these two strings right it's the hand that moves the minimum distance between these two and so it's a lot of playing instead of it's So the arm is not having to do that. Arm stays in one place. Slight movement maybe, but the hand navigates the inside corners between the two strings. That was something I fortunately did not have to learn for this performance, because that was part of the etudes I did. Um, Kreitzer. practicing the different kinds of string changes and doing it fast. So most of my thought was on the left hand and trying to relax the hand and trust the spacing. Um, so I would love to share that clip with you. Um, and just for fun, that this is one that's from far back taken by a friend of mine, um, just gives you a sense of the space and the fun evening, I hope it was for, for the people there. Um, this is definitely a trick I wanted to have done with and, and have it go well. I, um, had it really bombed, it, I, I had tried to prepare myself mentally, just get back on the horse and keep going, but I'll admit it would have been kind of a blow if, if I had really, um, fumbled this one, so... Let's go to it. So again, I was I was happy to I was happy to to have that. Um, listening back now, um, you know, it's uh, I'm I'm struck by what great music it is, <laughs> um, what effective writing. I mean, this is a spring storm, right? And uh, you know, there's a reason that that spot is famous, and. So luckily, my intonation is not the very first thing I notice. Um, however, I, I am noting for next time that um, I was very concerned in my preparation about the first three things. And then the rest of it, I remember my... my thinking was kind of like, if I, if I get that far, then, then I'm fine. I'm, I'm through the hard part. And I didn't quite listen critically enough in practice to all the accidentals. Another way to put it is I had prioritized having a really loose left hand and that was a good thing. 
because I certainly, the adrenaline, it's kind of fight or flight. You tend to make a fist that was going to tank this section. So I didn't do that. But when notes are moving so quickly, you have to make sure you cover the strings fully, right? And some of those, particularly the fourth fingers. If I put it down a little too light at that speed, it comes out the slightest bit flat. So, a little more critical listening and practice, uh, you know, could have alerted me to that beforehand. Um, and in all this talk about preparing for performance, there are always things that, right, you could have done better. And we, we know this going in. Hardly anybody says, all right, I am 100% ready for this performance tomorrow. There's no more work I could possibly do because it just couldn't get any better. I, I've never said that. I wonder if you have. Um, but what's important then is to mark it for later to say like, okay, well, this was the kind of thing I tended to neglect or I made this assumption and it wasn't true. Now, interestingly, this part has the same issue of having to cut out early and find your note. It's actually the same note, even if it's a different finger. But for this one, I had a routine. Uh, for the and I just didn't play this whole measure and I had rehearsed that many times and it came out better go figure um, I'm gonna share it it's actually it's a clip of the same moment but it's from a closer angle just that you can see my left hand a little better um, just in case that's interesting um, I am happy about this. I, I feel like the, the fingers were working together. I prioritized the spacing. By that I mean, you know, not thinking individual fingers going down and lifting, but blocks of fingers. What is the finger pattern? Whole steps and half steps between one, two, three, and four. So, you know, um, we won't call it bragging, but uh, it's important to celebrate the things that did come off according to plan, as well as mark what you need to do differently the next time. So intonation at the end aside, um, I'd like for you to see this angle. back. There's just one more clip. Um, excuse me. No more clips from the first movement. One from the second movement and one from the, the third movement to share. And um, I won't have too, too much to say about those because I do want to get a start on winter. And I want a chance to, to get to some of your questions. Um, Just to pause for a moment and look in the workbook, again, if you don't have the workbook, if you don't have my music, make sure you download it. Those links in the description will get you there. You just have to let me know where to send it. Um, mindset, tools, and techniques. That's practice makes performance, right? A lot of mindset talk here. Um, what I was thinking in the practice room, what I was thinking in the moment, and how I'm reflecting now. Th this part of the preparation I really want to emphasize because uh, there's a reason I put it first. We're understandably um, interested, some, some would say even obsessed with, you know, what to pre what's the etude that I need to do? What's the metronome mark for this section? Um, how many times should I repeat? That goes under techniques, right? What's the good etude? That goes under tools. But mindset says, 
you know, this <laughs> felt great, my last performance, and came off according to plan. This other thing, um, I really thought, you know, I thought I'd done great work on it in performance. It didn't hold up. I reflected. I think I uncovered possible reasons why that is what's going to inform for you the tools and the techniques that you need to use. So I invite you to at least identify the performance that you're going to write about when you fill in these questions in the workbook. And I would love for you to fill out the mindset page today. Again, it can be brief notes. This is just for you to, to look back on uh, when we've wrapped up the week. Um, I see some great questions already, and I will, I'm going to leave time at the end. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll even stay after the hour. <laughs> to get to some some questions because these are great ones um, let's look at something from the second movement um, so if you open up the music the second movement of spring we're in c-sharp minor right not the world's friendliest or most ringing key and because of that, I really, I spent a lot of time um, playing scales and arpeggios in that key. Just getting used to the resonance, or we could say even lack of resonance of the instrument in that key. Because what I knew from previous performances of this piece and, and also some, some other pieces in um, non-ringing keys, In performance, I might have a tendency to press because I'm not getting the feedback from the instrument that I am. Where these notes just want to ring forever. So it was important to me to identify a different kind of beauty in these notes. So not an easy ring, but... You know, what, what's going to be the resonance, what's the rub of, of these tones, and how to match with the orchestra. Because you can, you know, best laid plans, right? And I'm not saying my colleagues have questionable intonation, but you never know what A the harpsichord is going to be tuned to, right? Maybe they, you come out and it's kind of high, and then you've got to re adjust everything from in your inner ear. A lot of note matching, right? Tones that appear and reappear and reappear. And you generally need those to be the same. So all of that was part of my thought going in. Um, the clip we're going to see is basically from the climax of the movement. And so if you look at... Um, we're coming in about bar 26, 25, 26, somewhere around there. And then going to the end of the movement. Um, you'll see in the fingerings that I chose, I, I did want to make the difference in timbre one time. Um, I do wish I had been a little bit bolder on this mini slide. If I was going to do it, I wish I'd really done it, but I did something ultra tasteful here and almost didn't come out, but so be it. Um, I feel like I, I was worried about going sharp in this key, so I really put a lid on it and I think I ended up a little bit under my colleagues, but I'll let you be the judge of that in this um, 
clip from the slow movement. And this is a, a vertical video taken by a different friend. Hey, what's that person doing on their phone? Um, <laughs> Hollywood Bowl is a fun place. Um, and this was a great crowd and we had like a full moon, I think, and everything else. So um, I was happy not to not to press. I felt like I'd, I'd escaped that trap. And, and at this point I was feeling like, okay, I've, I've definitely settled in. Um, Bad news is spring is going to come to an end soon, and then, then I've got the two movements, summer and autumn, that I've never performed before. Um, but I'll share one thing from the third movement, um, which has to do with memory. So we had one rehearsal for this, uh, and that was that morning. And my colleague, they could have Generally, orchestral musicians don't like rehearsing, right? Um, so this could have been my colleagues just being nice, but they were saying, wow, only one rehearsal for this. We really could have used more, more rehearsals. And I thought, yeah, you're just saying that. Um, this piece has a lot of details to decide on. Um, and so one rehearsal of, you know, 75 minutes or so is not much time for a 40 minute solo piece. Um, but Really, I have to take my hat off to my colleagues because they, they did really great work on, you know, basically a run through and touching a few spots. And I felt free to shape things knowing that they would come along with me. Um, but I was also concerned about my own memory stuff. There are a lot of places in this piece where you can go one way or another way. And if you look at the beginning of the third movement of spring, um, I had done well in the first two movements of spring, no memory stuff yet. And, um, and of course I did the rehearsal from memory because I, I needed to test um, as I'd been testing in the practice room. So if you look at bar 11, uh, we have these e this echo. Boom, start of the solo line. If you flip forward um, a couple pages and look at the very end of the piece at R. Repeat. So you've got three bars forte, three bars piano. In the beginning, it's just one bar forte and one bar piano. And in rehearsal, there was a giant hole where I was supposed to play. Um, instead, there was nothing because I, I was about to do another echo or something. <laughs> so you can bet that I covered that spot many times that day in practice. So just because I'm proud of having not screwed it up in the concert, I will play that for you now. It just takes a moment, but it's also a beautiful line. Um, it's a chance to show the tender side of spring. Um, and a different bow stroke than some of the shorter ones. Good. I'm ready for ready for further action. Now, I, I thought I actually smiled there because I was happy to get the memory thing, but apparently I just had my, my usual 
<laughs> usual neutral look. Um, good. I want to tell you about... I, now, I said I hadn't performed the Four Seasons as a set um, ever before. It's, it, there was a, a half-truth, because uh, the week before, I was at a chamber festival in my hometown of Lexington, Kentucky. Of course, now I'm in L.A., an Angelino, but um, from Lexington, Kentucky, and was there for a chamber festival, and we needed to put together a 60-minute program in a bar. Um, yeah, don't need to get into the whole story, but for, for various reasons, we, we always do a little concert in a bar or a brewery or something there. And it was scheduled so that the 60-minute thing was practically right after we all arrived in town. And so we didn't have much of a chance to put anything together. And then Akiko had the great idea, why don't you play the Four Seasons? And just the, all we had was a string quartet, basically. But that was enough. You know, we'd be missing the harpsichord, but we could play the Four Seasons and I would get a chance to play through it. Now... At that occasion, I didn't test it. I didn't test the memory. I used music, but it was so great to perform in a less formal setting. You know, there were 30 people there instead of 10,000. And I could try out tempos. I could try transitions. I could try bow strokes, see what felt really comfortable, what was, you know, because if something was kind of uncomfortable in front of 30 people, it was going to be much more so in front of the big crowd. Um, my parents were there, my kids were there, they were playing pool in the room next door, and um, they weren't having beers, by the way. I'm not that irresponsible, but it was a great chance. A week before was a perfect time to get to play that, and um, I will say that my eight-year-old son, for the rest of that week, got obsessed with the Four Seasons. He started putting on recordings of it and listening to it, and, you know, they knew I had a concert coming up, but I guess I didn't make it clear what I was doing. So when they came to the Hollywood Bowl to hear the concert, um, my son said afterward, oh, I didn't know you were going to play the Four Seasons. That's my favorite piece. And it's like, what did you think all this was about? <laughs> like, that's all I've been playing for the last month. And you didn't even know what the Four Seasons was until a week ago when you heard it at that bar. Um, so, yeah, I don't take them to a lot of bars, but they came to that one. Um, well, this is a perfect chance for us to get a little start on winter. And I know for those of you who scheduled just an hour for this, you'll want to be jetting out of here soon. But let's just get a preliminary look at it, and then we'll do more marking up of this music next time. Um, this is another non-resonant key, right? E flat. Um, so we've got... Um, I'm just fo following the print here as far as Boeing's and all of that. Um, it's a beautiful melody, and there are a number of elements we're going to look at the rest of this week. This idea of series. This comes up all the time in Baroque music and, and most music, in fact, but... Um, what do we do with that? Well, shouldn't play it the same every one, right? Another series. K is just like the beginning, but in a different key. Probably shouldn't be the same as the beginning, right? Another series. M mimicking the beginning. Repetition this time. and an echo, actually, 
written in by Vivaldi. So as we explore this music the rest of the week and start talking more specific bowings and fingerings, I want you to know the sort of canvas we're working with. It's a short movement. I chose that so that we could get into some detail with it. Um, but what are the first decisions we want to make with this? Is it fingerings? Is it tempo? Bowings? Um, dynamics? Do I want to start marking in dynamics? Um, and how do you practice a slow movement anyway? You can't practice it slowly, can you? <laughs> so we're going to have some fun with that this week and start ourselves off with the right mindset so that we can identify the tools that we might need to, to hone and put some great practice techniques to use, okay? Mindset, tools, techniques. That's practice makes performance. And then you could have this as a great, you know, this is a, I used to play wedding gigs as a teenager and this would, this was an often requested number. Some, some brides would even want to walk down the aisle to this because the accompaniment. That's kind of a nice walking speed and we'd get to the end. Repeat. If they had a big family, might have to repeat it five times. All right, time for me to get to get to some questions. Um, first one is uh, in in the big solo. We're talking about the this one. Um, was there the sort of here it comes, here it comes anxiety in the moment, or the sort of disbelief like ah, oh, it's here, I'm doing it. Um, and both of those being um, unhelpful self-consciousness, I would say there was a little bit of both of those. Now, because I knew to expect that um, in the practice room, I was able to do some replacement. Now, it doesn't work to say, okay, this moment is coming. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Um, you can't tell yourself not to think of something. You've got to replace that thought with something else. So I need, in the practice room, I went back to the spots before then where I identified that I was thinking of it. Um, and for me, that really came I'm between C and D now. So right there, when I hear that, the wind, the storm whipping up, that's when I start thinking ahead to that business. And that's, it's at that point that I need something constructive, something helpful to think about. Um, so first I'm, I'm gonna imagine really windy scales. Sorry, that is an A natural. <laughs> and I'm going to be feeling a relaxed hand in this double stop mode. So after I play my windy scales, because that's what I'm focused on there, now I'm presetting my relaxed double stop hand. And there, I'm, I'm just conscious of that skill that I know so well, the, the arm level hand business. That's something, it's happening in the moment, but it's a place where I can put my focus. So I'm not focusing on a difficulty, I'm focusing on a strength uh, once it actually comes. So that's a great question, and that's how I chose to, to handle it. Um, so Charlotte asks, uh, how did I decide on the articulation um, being on string or off string, and it would be very different with a Baroque bow? How did that influence me? That's a topic we're going to talk about more later this week. So I'm not trying to put you off entirely. And by the way, great to see you here, Charlotte. Um, the whole, now these pieces were written, well, just four years before this violin was made. So this is 1729 and these were published, I think I have the year right, in 1725. Um, and they did not have bows that looked like this back then, <laughs> not for another 100 years or 150 years. So, you know, 
how much do I want to imitate how they might have played it back then. Um, I didn't go too far in that direction. You know, I used enough, you know, plenty of vibrato as you saw and heard. Um, I would call my approach, you know, quasi romantic. Uh, what I was most interested in was that sense of wonder um, from the, the program, the, the sonnets, the images uh, that he suggested. I think they're entirely appropriate and really well written musically. Um, so I wanted to convey that always with whatever articulation I thought best. Um, we'll get into some more specifics of how things might have worked on the other kind of bow and all that, but, but right, I didn't go too far in that direction. Um, and then a follow-up, um, since you can't rehearse the concerto every day with the orchestra, how do you get around that? Did I play with piano, listen to recordings, knowing how the parts fit? Uh, right, we went over one tryout performance, to be honest. If I had been smarter, I would have planned some more. With this piece, I felt okay with that because I had performed two of the seasons quite a bit before. And because I had accompanied the other two so much, um, I, it couldn't have hurt for me to do more with piano. But then again, piano is a little weird with this piece. So, um, But you're right, most of it was spending more time with the score than I had spent with it ever <laughs> for this piece. Um, and just really hearing as much as I could in my inner ear, hearing the whole sound. Recordings I wanted to be careful with with this piece because it, recordings are so different with this. I, if you read emails I wrote, I was obsessed with Nigel Kennedy's recording back in the day and he had his own stuff and everybody's just gonna have their own stuff. I, I wanted to really keep in my inner ear the way I wanted to shape this. So I didn't do much with recordings this time. It was mostly score and hearing my shapes as I looked at the score, hearing the harmonies, getting a sense of the structure. Um, so from Melinda asks about um, the Jumbotron, uh, was it distracting? Now I should say that from where I was standing, I can't see those screens. So I'm set back on the stage. Those screens are out in front so the audience sees them, but I can't because otherwise I think that would have been distracting. I mean, I would have just, I wouldn't have looked at them, but it would be, it would have been impossible to ignore that they were there. So I would have needed to sort of mentally prepare for that and have a visual focal point. By the way, I did have a visual focal point. Um, and we'll talk about centering later in the week, but I had a spot at the foot of the stage lower than my eye level that I could always return to if I found my eyes kind of wandering and just kind of needed to recenter physically and visually, kind of get back to the middle, but no, I couldn't see the screens. Um, Andre uh, mentioning, right, with the slow movement of winter, do we want to start with a fourth finger and yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into fingering choices with that later. You're right, fourth finger vibrato, generally not going to be the strongest for most people, but that does put us in third position, which a lot of people are more comfortable finding. Um, and, and do we want to be on the A string or the E string? What fits the sound better and what, what leaves us with string changes that make sense? So th those are going to be great specifics to get into during the week um, for the ornamentation because uh, Melinda noticed that I uh, did a little variation that I guess it was at the end of spring um, slow movement do I always do the same or do I have a few versions I pick from when I was younger I always did the same and I rehearsed it um, this time I <laughs> I branched out a little bit that's branching out for me I did what you said I had a few versions that I, and I practiced each of them a fair amount. And then I, I always had my favorite that I kind of gravitated back to, but, um, but I did leave it open to trying some, some other things. That's something Milstein would do and not just in 
a piece like the Four Seasons where everybody ornaments, but he would do that in more standard repertoire too. He had all kinds of different ways of doing things and he would be trying them out all day. And then in performance, he could pick, <laughs> pick one. Um, and Julie asks about uh, key words. Um, that also is going to be a great topic for the week because that goes to mindset. Um, I love particularly for spots where I could have a million thoughts <laughs> like this is a hard spot that I don't want to mess up. Um, it's important, as I say, to have something to replace those unhelpful thoughts because unhelpful thoughts will cram into a vacuum. Um, but if I have a key word that fits the moment, um, then particularly if it calls forth a, a visual image, an image that's much more powerful than an instruction like keep your hand loose, do this. So I'm embarrassed to say, Julie, that my key word for the was that I didn't have one and I had more of an instruction as I said, okay, loose double stop hand that's not a keyword and it doesn't call up an image except for a hand. Um, so I would have done better. Let me challenge myself to come up with what I should have had for that moment. So that, that's a good challenge for me, Julie. Um, Sandra asks, how did this piece get chosen? And was it my choice and how far in advance? Um, so in this case, this was a request by our administration. You know, you, all of you may know that when soloists play pieces, it's kind of, it's always a dance between them and uh, the presenting organization, usually the orchestra, or it could be a recital series or whatever, and a conductor, if there is a conductor. So a soloist may want to play piece X, but the orchestra really was hoping for piece Y because it fits in with the program that week, but the conductor only knows piece Z and is not willing to learn another piece. <laughs> so this can happen. Now, in this case, they had the conductor, they had the rest of the program, they knew that Vivaldi was going to fit the program, they knew that the conductor was looking forward to conducting that. So when they came to me, oh, and they also knew that that was a great summer venue piece, right, the Hollywood Bowl. So I will admit when they first came to me and said, we'd like you to play the Four Seasons at this day and time, my, my first reaction was Four Seasons. Hmm, like a little bit of a kid's piece. I played that. I didn't say this, but I <clears throat> thought oh, I played that a long time ago. I kind of want to play something new, like something more grown up. And boy, I'm glad I just actually went ahead and said, yes, I'm happy to play the Four Seasons because uh, I got to rediscover how what great pieces they are, if you want to call it they or, or one piece, um, how evocative and just how much fun to perform. Uh, so it wasn't my choice, but I, by the, by the time I was two, three months out, I had made it my choice and uh, it felt really great to, to be looking forward to that. Um, Anna asks, when something doesn't go as well as you'd like on stage, what do you do or think immediately afterward to have a pre-prepared thought? Um, the short answer is I need to have enough um, things to focus on for any given line in the music that I can just go right on to the next one. As I say, these unhelpful thoughts love a vacuum. So this is a mistake I made in, you know, when I was younger, I would practice the, the passages and I'd practice the notes, but I didn't practice much performing and dealing with those voices and those thoughts. And so if a passage didn't come off, right, I'd keep dwelling on it. Now, I won't say I've conquered that entirely, but let's say that, right. And that, and then next. Yeah, I'd be feeling bad here, but then I would go to focus on the very next thing. And I would have key words and thoughts for that. I'd have images 
to bring forth and that's really the only way, because without that, yes, I'll be stuck on what happened before. You know, see, the audience doesn't remember. They don't care. Maybe there's some cocky kid out there saying, ha ha, he messed up. And they'll get to remember that and tell the story. But um, most people have already forgotten when you're thinking of it. Um, and then Anita Reverb. Did I hear Reverb as I was playing or after I played and how I managed to ignore it. Um, they do use reverb there. Subtle, subtle. They're very good at miking and I happened to know a secret about um, the mics there. The soloists who move around a lot and are always changing how far they are from the microphones, they have to bump up the sound and the, the, the amplified sound more because they can't be playing with the levels all the time if someone's swaying here and now they're six feet away and now they're three feet away. So they need to pick one level that's going to work for all of that. And it need, if, because the sound's going to be a little bit thinner when they're further away, they have to turn up the reverb more. And I didn't want that. So I planted myself pretty close. And I, I don't tend to move around a ton when I play anyway. So I was hoping that by doing so, they could get, they could really dial in the level and not have to use as much reverb. So when I was playing, I heard some, but I, I'm used to that on that stage when, uh, if I'm concert master and I have a concert master solo, we use these microphones that clip on right here it is. And uh, it's like two inches from the bridge. And so I'm used to, I don't even breathe on the mic when I'm playing a concert master solo. <laughs> like breathe up above it. <laughs> because otherwise my breath will get amplified in there. Um, so I, that I'm used to. But right, the sound of any hall can be distracting when you first hear it. Um, so that I was ready for. Um, Sandra, how often have, have I performed as, we've got just a couple more here and, and then we'll close for today. How often have I, have I performed as solos of my own orchestra and how does that differ from playing with another orchestra? Um, I mean, I like it better with my own orchestra. Um, I never soloed with the Chicago Symphony, which I was a member of for nine years, um, except to play a couple incidental things up in the balcony that was like kind of a solo but and I got to bark like a dog in a Charles Ives piece um, but with St. Paul I actually got to play spring I'll share that story later in the week St. Paul Chamber Orchestra um, and here I've done it several times and yeah you, you you know the orchestra's tendencies so you usually you're able to take greater risks knowing how people are likely to react even you you might know individual people like if like uh in the Beethoven, if I were playing the Beethoven concerto and the, the places where you're accompanying the bassoon, they have... If I know that our great principal bassoon is going to be there playing that with me, I can, you know... Well, I would need to practice the Beethoven concerto if I were going to demonstrate all that for you, but um, I could feel free perhaps to take more risks knowing that he would have eyes and ears on me and so that that sort of comfort is great. Um, Richard asks, uh, do anything to help with the stamina of being able to perform the entire work without being too fatigued? We're going to get to that because I've got uh, some winter, at least one winter clip for you where that's a factor. I know fatigue was a factor. Um, you know, all I tried to do is, you know, get my hours up. Um, if I'm practicing comfortably three, four hours in a day, then a 40 minute concerto, which this basically is, is much easier than, and I have to make sure that a good portion of that three or four hours is performance based practice, you know, where I'm really, I'm playing at full intensity, but practicing how, how to keep that within limits, right? That I'm not adding extra tension. So that's, that's also something we're going to talk more about. Um, and last ones, how long to relearn and memorize all of this? That's from Anjali. Um, I would say it was like a three-month process. I made this a three-month process, knowing that I was familiar with the pieces and had performed much of it before. Um, had I been learning a 40-minute piece for the first time, I certainly would have left more than three months. Um, and I would say the me most of the memory drilling was in the last two weeks. As I said, I... I played through it a week before and even at that point didn't feel 
comfortable to try all the memory yet. Uh, so most of the memory drilling was in the last two weeks, just to clean up spots where you could zig or zag. Um, and Carlos asked, yeah, does every member in the string section get a mic on their instrument? Uh, violins and violas, yes. Cellos and basses, I believe, each stand gets an area mic that's pointed, that's down on the floor and pointed there. Um, I believe that's how they do it. And then same for woodwind and brass instruments, that each instrument has a mic above them. Violins and violas are the unfortunate ones that get to clip something onto the instrument. So, all right. <laughs> well, these are great questions. I, I really hope you will be able to join me as well for the rest of the week. We've got some great things in store. Um, the deeper we go with this, I hope the richer your experience and that as you get a look into my mindset and my preparation, you can see how you can leverage that for your own performances, because that's what I want you to take away from this. Um, so join me tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, as long as you're registered, meaning that you've clicked that link and you've downloaded the materials, then I'll be able to send you info on where you can watch the replays, where those are going to live. Um, and most of all, I, I just uh, hope you come back and, and have fun. I love spending this time with you. So thank you so much. And I will see you tomorrow for more Four Seasons What Lies Beneath. See you soon.